We're going to review a second what, what we had talked about last time. I've left most of our chart here from last time. We're going to review basically what we had talked about then. And then uh, today we're going to press on and, and talk mostly about this column. Um, the things that, that are going on in our worship that are not what God has commanded, but are the things that the church has developed and, and kind of ornamented God's gifts with. Uh, through time and, and the word we're going to be talking about is ceremony and ceremonies in the church is, is kind of the topic uh, and and if we get to it maybe we won't but I've, I've got um, beginning to start to look at the structure then of the, the divine service uh, but let's pray oh lord have mercy upon your servants as we gather this morning uh, to study your word and to receive your teaching uh, according to the holy scriptures we look forward to receiving your teaching in the scriptures and to receive the sacrament of the altar in the service. Uh, and so we ask that you would enlighten us with your Holy Spirit that we may understand as it is your will to teach us uh, what it is that you would give to us in that service uh, and how we might receive it rightly. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, okay, so, so the summary from last time, we were talking first off about kind of direction, in the, in the divine service. Um, there are parts of the divine service that are, we might say, from God to man. God is coming to serve us. And what would that be? What, what's an example of... What, what part of the service is God serving us? Yeah, it's true. I have, I, have the, I have the answers right up here. <laughs> These are the answers you gave last time. So it's, it's not cheating. It's just looking at your notes. It's great. Yeah, okay. So the, the word preached and, and, and uh, spoken in the scriptures, certainly, reading the scriptures, the sacrament of the altar, and, and those are the main chunks of the divine service. Um, and and we, would, we would go ahead and describe this as, you know, our shorthand, our Lutheran phrases, word and sacrament. If you hear me talk about word and sacrament, I'm talking about this stuff. Stuff that God himself has instituted, has established, where he's coming to us and he's serving us with his gifts. And we could put... Uh, when we have baptism, certainly baptism goes up there. Um, the absolution, uh, the office of the keys that way. Uh, great, okay. And we wanted to, we wanted to point out that um, Christ comes not to be served, according to his words, but he comes to serve. Uh, and we want to point out that the, the main direction in worship is, is this. And, and I hope this is pretty intuitive to see. Once you make a distinction between Here's what God is doing to serve us in the divine service. And then here's where we're returning our thanks to God. Well, which one of those is the most important part of that? What's the main part of, of uh, worship then in that case? Receiving. Yeah, receiving. Um, and, and we talked last time, we won't rehash it all, but we talked last time really just about justification. Uh, the doctrine of justification, we're uh, justified by grace alone, through faith alone. It's God's work. It's not our work that we're meriting anything. Uh, if we were pagans, I suppose, and our whole religion was us doing, you know, making sacrifices and appeasing God for ourselves, then this whole formula would be backwards. The main part about worship would be our sacrifices, our giving, our praise. We want to make sure we're doing all that right. Um, not so in the Christian faith. In the Christian faith, uh, you're counted righteous before God. Because of what Christ has done. He's come to serve you, to declare you righteous, to give you his gifts freely. You know, out of love, out of, out of grace. So that means the main part of our worship is going to be God serving us, us receiving. Uh, and, and what is it in us that's, that's receiving God's grace, God's gifts? The Holy Spirit. Well, okay, the Holy Spirit. But what is the Holy Spirit working in us? <laughs> Looking for faith. There we go. Yeah, faith is that which receives. Uh, we want to make sure we're not thinking of faith as something I'm drumming up in myself, some some great quality in me. The reason faith justifies is because oh, my faith is just so so wonderful. It's way better than that guy's right there. My faith is amazing. No, no, no. Faith is something, as you said, the Holy Spirit is is giving, is working in us, uh, and that faith then. It's not because of how great the faith is. It's because of what it's pointing to. It's because of what it's receiving. Um, Dr. Weinrich at the seminary liked to talk about faith is swallowing. You don't, you know, go to someone after dinner and say, hey, how was the swallowing? You know, 
Well, the, the swallowing went fine. The point was the food was amazing. You know, you're missing the point. Uh, faith is just the receiving. Faith is just how you're receiving God's gifts. Um, on, on that point, we, we made the point that uh, the highest worship then that, that we can offer to God is not uh, our praise and thanksgiving. We, we do that. That's true. But the highest worship then is to receive God's gifts. The highest worship is faith. It's the Holy Spirit works in us, which receives God's gifts. Uh, and receives them then in the way that, that he chooses to give them. So we were talking last time a little bit about sticking to the institution. In other words, if you're not, uh, if you're not observing the sacrament the way Christ actually instituted it, you're not observing the sacrament. Right? So, so in this area, in this column, faith uh, and faithfulness, in a sense, are the, are the keys over here. This is the area of, of faith where um, you know, there, there's not really leeway. In terms of, well, I know he said, you know, take bread, but I'd really like to use, I don't know, say something Bananas. ridiculous. Bananas, thank you. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Uh, I, I'd really like to use this, or I'd really like to, you know, I know he said these words, but I think these words, you know, say it better. In, in this area, we don't have leeway, and we're not going to um, sacrifice any of this or change any of this. Or give anything. This is God's institution. This is the stuff that's really necessary to, to be the way it is. Today, uh, as we were ending last time, we were moving more to this column, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, over here, well, we, we talked a little bit beforehand we started. We had this Greek word up here, and the category of things that are not instituted by God, but are, but are instituted by men, by Christians in the church. Um, one of the words we want to know is adiaphora. It's a fancy Greek word. Uh, I just told you guys. Now, now here's the pop quiz. What does it mean? Uh, neither commanded nor forbidden. Yeah, neither, good. Neither commanded nor forbidden. And the example was uh, nothing in the scriptures commanded Debbie to eat her, uh, her McDonald's this morning. Nothing in the scriptures forbid her from doing it. She was free. So where there's adiaphora, there's freedom. Okay? It's different from, well, <coughs> the institution of the sacrament. You don't have freedom to just do that however you want. You've got to stick to the institution. You don't have the option of baptizing in Gatorade. That's not the institution, okay? But over here, there's, there's freedom. And, and how do you um, explain the fact that Ave Opera also extends and covers things that weren't Ave Opera in the Old Testament that don't apply to us? Oh, okay, yeah. Women should wear coverings on their head when they go into the vehicle. We, we see yeah, that on the opera now. Everything's, you know, uh, uh, you know, fulfilled by Christ. And so there are those things that we don't do that were that some say, oh, you have to do it because it's commanded in the Old Testament. Yeah, sure. So yeah, how sure. do you differentiate that? Yeah, so, so what about uh, the difference between what was commanded and, and forbidden in the Old Testament versus... Now in the New Testament. Well, there's a few examples. Um, one would be, for instance, in Colossians. I think it's Colossians 2. I might try and find it real fast. Um, as an example. Yeah, Paul's talking about this question. In fact, this came up for Paul a lot. Because as he's going out and preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, there are some other Jews, maybe even from kind of the circle of the apostles, but they clearly had a wrong idea, going out and trying to convince the Gentiles that they had to observe all those things, all those Old Testament laws and commands. And so Paul gives answer at one point here in Colossians 2, 16. He says, Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Uh, and there's a number of other examples. Well, Christ himself, you know, there's the point in, in Mark, at least, or in the other Gospels, where he declares all foods clean. So, there, so there's a number of things that are specifically pointed out in the New Testament as not applying anymore, however you want to think about that, essentially saying not all of those things that were commanded in the Old Testament are commanded in the same way in the New Testament. But maybe the broader point would simply be... Uh, a command in the scriptures, here's what we don't want to do. We don't want to open the Bible, and every time it says you, oh, it must be me, you know? Um, where, where Jesus talks to the, the you know, rich young ruler and says, uh, you know, go sell everything you have. 
And then, you know, or, or even worse, how about, well, maybe that's a bad example, but, but you know, go pluck your eye out. Go. Uh, in any case, we, we don't want to just read the Bible, especially the Old Testament, and think every time it says you, it's me personally. The Bible is not a love letter directly from God to you specifically. Uh, the Bible is a collection of the writings of the prophets and the writings mm-hmm. of the apostles. And so there has to be some, some context in understanding what's going on here. The commands of the Old Testament were given to the people of the Old Testament in a particular place, particular time. Uh, you know, build an ark, make it this way, put this metal on it and put these things on it and put a tent over it and do it this way. Uh, and those are not instructions for every Christian congregation now. Those were all instructions then. Now, within those instructions are commands that are clearly repeated in the New Testament. Usually we just talk about that as the moral law or the Ten Commandments. So murder was forbidden in the Old Testament. Guess what? Murder is still forbidden. And you can kind of see why. I mean, it kind of makes sense. That's not a, a controversial one. Um, but there's a number of things of things like that. Uh, it can be a little tricky to... to wiggle them out, but the, but the main point would be that the things of the Old Testament in and of themselves were commanded for that people. And we can't just willy-nilly take stuff from that context and stick it uh, uh, one for one in ours. Is that yeah. fair, so, fair enough? We have an altar of wood. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. in the Old Testament it says it needs to be out of stone, it's not, it's not carved right. by yeah. human hands, and all of that kind of stuff. And so... Like you say, I want to uh, know that okay. If I when people rip something out of its context, yeah, yeah, I'm not to to go. Oh gosh, we're doing everything wrong. Well, this happens all the time with, um, you know, there are, there are Christian churches that go out of their way to try and be as Jewish as they would think, or or as Old Testament faithful as they can we're going to observe well well how about this how about you know you've got to worship on on the sabbath you got to worship on saturday well here's an example by the way where paul's pretty explicit right let no one pass judgment on you in concern of a sabbath or a new moon or a day or a festival uh in other words well all foods are clean all days are clean all days are holy uh and in fact the christian church as it happens uh, by and large has chosen to worship on sunday because the day of the resurrection, right. And that's even a way that we kind of confess with what we do with a particular ceremony, a ceremony of when we meet for, for the divine service, of confessing Christ uh, and, and confessing that all things are fulfilled in him, in the resurrection. Um, there's, there's a reason. It even kind of makes sense if you think about it. The whole Old Testament was, was preparation. So isn't there something kind of very reasonable about they met on the day of preparation, uh, they observe the Sabbath. Now we observe the day of the fulfillment, the day of the resurrection. Anyway, but, but uh, as, it, as it stands, yeah, as far as the Adiaphora goes, again, things that are not commanded or forbidden in the scriptures, there's freedom. Over here, it's, it's faith and faithfulness. It's sticking to what God has said. Over here, there's freedom. Uh, and, and when we're in the realm of freedom, then we're not so much in the realm of faith. We're now in the realm of love if we want to make that distinction. Uh, and I'll talk more about what that means in, in a second. Um, maybe we'll, we'll approach it this way. We want to observe God's institutions. We want to observe what he's commanded. Uh, and we want to receive his word the way he gives it, receive his sacrament the way he gives it. So, okay, well, how are we going to do that? Well, I guess we're going to get together. And, and immediately there are practical questions. We just talked about one. Okay, when are you going to meet? Where are you going to meet? What's everyone going to be wearing? Are you going to be standing? Are you going to be sitting? Are you all going to be staring at each other in the middle of the room? Are you facing one way? I mean, the, the point being, there's going to be ceremony. There's going to be some sort of procedure. Um, when you go to a restaurant, you maybe have to look to see, is it, you know, seat yourself? Does it say wait to be seated? There's, there's a ceremony to be observed. Um, if you've ever been to a, 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 an orchestra concert, Right? There's a ceremony that kind of takes place. And maybe if you're not familiar, you don't know it, but first the, you know, they're all tuning, then the, well, first the concertmaster comes out and stands there and, and tunes everyone off of him, well, off the oboe. And then he sits down, and then the conductor comes out, and everyone stands up. There's a, there's a whole thing that happens, right? 
doesn't have to be that way. That's the way uh, for, for concerts, the tradition has become. Okay, fine. Um, but in anything you do in life, and, and including also when, when Christians are gathering in the church, there's going to be some kind of a ceremony. Even if that is, um, everyone's going to dress in their you know, casual t-shirts and we're all just going to sit around. Maybe you've got a coffee shop in the back. Everyone's going to have a coffee. You're going to relax. We're going to uh, uh, play some, some music. We're going to praise God. And, uh, and we're going to hear his word. Okay, that, that is a ceremony in itself, or it involves certain ceremonies. So I, I just want to make sure when we're using the word ceremony, I'm using it very broadly. It's not just for the stuff that looks Roman Catholic. <laughs> they don't have a monopoly on ceremony. There's going to be some sort of a, a, a ceremony. There's a great article. Um, I think it's a, a John Kleinig, Dr. Kleinig, um, who, who uh, he did the Leviticus commentary. But anyway, I think he wrote this article on witting or unwitting ritualists. In other words, his point is, we all have rituals, and any group of people that gets together, any church, there are rituals. The question is, are you aware of them or not? Uh, are, you, are you unwittingly just following along with the ritual, or are you a witting ritualist? Do you know what's going on and why we're doing it? It's kind of why I'm teaching some of this now, uh, so that you're aware of what we're doing in the divine service and, and why. Okay, so the question then is, well... We're going to have some sort of ceremony. Well, what are we going to do? Are we all going to stand? Are we all going to, you know, wear funny shoes? What, what, what are we actually going to do for our ceremony in the service? Uh, and this is where I want to turn to Galatians. And we want to talk about what is our freedom for? We've got Adiaphora. That is, there are things that God has given us freedom with. They're not commanded. They're not forbidden. But go to Galatians 5. In fact, Galatians is, is great for... The topic we were just talking about. That's where Paul is expressly dealing with certain Jewish teachers who are coming to the churches Paul has planted, and they're trying to convince them, you must observe these ceremonies. You must observe circumcision. You must worship on the Sabbath. You got to do this, that, and the other thing. You got to observe the Old Testament laws. They're coming in and they're demanding um, uh, certain, well, certain ceremonies. Uh, and they're saying, you're, you're not a Christian if you don't observe these things. And, and in fact, there's a certain echo here. Luther really loved Galatians because Luther found a certain echo for himself of the time of the Reformation. The Pope essentially saying, look, you've got to observe these man-made traditions or else you can't be saved. I mean, that, was kind of, that was kind of the line, right? So in Galatians, go to Galatians 5. Uh, all through 3 and 4, he's setting up this argument, by the way, about uh, how we are free in Christ. How in Christ now um, you are not subject to the law in such a way that uh, you must observe all the Old Testament regulations under you know, pain of, of damnation. Right? He, he's saying in Christ there's now freedom. You've been justified. You've been saved. You've been redeemed. Now there is freedom. Uh, so in 5 he's talking about this. When 5 starts, for, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand fast and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Right? So he's saying, look, don't don't submit then to these teachers who want to tell you you must be circumcised to be saved. You must worship on the Sabbath to be saved or whatever it is. Uh, and he's going to talk about that for a while, about the importance of, of retaining that freedom. Um, so we, we certainly don't want to import laws and traditions as, as binding on the church where God has not commanded it. You know, we're not going to establish, um, we're not going to say thus says the Lord when he hasn't said it. That would be wrong. <laughs> that would be false. That would be, that would be to undermine the entire gospel. But then as he gets down to the end of that argument, starting at 13, he has a, he has a caveat. He said, okay, I've, I've exalted freedom this long. Now go to verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love be servants of one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that's why, um, that's why I made a comment before, I think is rather important. If over here, if we're dealing with, well, let's stick it up here, I suppose. If over here we're in the realm of faith, in which, you know, think of uh, the Nicene Creed. Here's the things we believe. Well, if someone comes in and demands that you stop believing those things, you say, no. This is what God's word has said. Faith doesn't yield. Okay? But over here, uh, where there's freedom, 
To do that, you'll need to be online. Well, I don't want to be online. <laughs> <laughs> was that my phone? Did this thing no, no, oh, oh, that was you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> just checking. Um, to do that, you'll need to be online. <laughs> Where there's freedom, then, we're, we're in the realm of love. And that's the point Paul is making. Where there's Christian freedom, um, Christian freedom does not mean, well, Christian freedom does not mean, well, God hasn't said one way or the other, so I'm just going to do whatever I want. Just to confirm. There we go. Christian freedom doesn't mean, well, I'm just going to do whatever I want, whatever pleases me. Um, and I think this is something maybe it's, it's worth thinking about. Or something that we ought to think about more, perhaps. Um, it's a very American kind of thought, right? Of, you know, go to church on Sunday. Here, here's what God's teaching me. Uh, and certainly, you know, we like the, the basic points of the law. Yeah, I'm not going to murder anyone. I'm not going to steal anything. Uh, but then the, the rest of my life, that's for, I just get to decide what I want to do, right? It's up to me to just decide. Well, Paul's point is, uh, your life is not yours. Your life is in, well, it's, it's God's. God has redeemed you. He's purchased you. But then also now he's giving you this freedom in Christ to love your neighbor, right? So all of life is, is not um, your own choice how to serve yourself. It's to, to serve and love your neighbor. Uh, and this applies especially when we're talking about um, worship and, and this category of the things that the church has established. The church has established certain customs, even traditions, out of love, as a way of serving one another, as a way of um, teaching the faith as a way of, of you know, building up and edifying the body of Christ, building up and edifying the church. Uh, the church is not, uh, or at least should not have, maybe in some cases has, has failed, but uh, all through history, but the church is not meant to use its freedom in the service, in the worship, to, uh, you know, well, this seems fun. Let's do that. Uh, that's not the point. Uh, Paul's going to talk about you know, serving one another in love. Actually, this does come up in a worship context. It, it's an odd context for us. But if you go to 1 Corinthians 14, this is where Paul actually speaks of order and, and freedom within the church, within the church service. In 1 Corinthians 14, um, Paul's dealing with a, a really bizarre kind of situation in Corinth, in the Corinthian church where, first of all, there are prophets. There, there appear to be New Testament prophets who are in some way receiving revelations from God. They're, they're speaking such things. There are these different um, gifts of the Spirit that have apparently been poured out and, and have been given uh, through the apostles, through the laying on of hands, through the preaching of the gospel. Uh, and so there are people who can heal, and there are people who can uh, speak in, in foreign languages and all sorts of things, right? Right? Well, Paul's coming in 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 14, and he's saying, okay, look, stop using these gifts to build up yourself and and magnify yourself and make yourself seem great and amazing and and holy, and use the gifts God has given you in love to serve your neighbor. Um, 13 was the whole beautiful chapter on on love, right? Love is patient, love is kind, so on and so forth. You've heard that at a wedding somewhere. Um, Chapter 14, make love your aim and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Uh, For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God, for no one understands him. On the other hand, he who prophesies speaks to men for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. In other words, at that particular point, he's kind of upbraiding those who have this gift now of speaking in other languages. Well, it's not going to do anyone any good if you're just getting up there, firing off in you know, Russian or something, and no one understands that. Uh, is that something in love for your neighbor? Well, no, unless there's someone able to actually translate and, and speak it. Or are you just getting up there and showing off your, your fancy, you know, spiritual gift you've got? Uh, in any case, by the end of this whole, whole chunk, um, down at, at 26. So what then, brethren? 1 Corinthians fourteen twenty six. What then? When you come together... Each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. And again, in that context, it appears there were a number of people in this congregation with uh, these gifts of, of prophesying and um, gifts from the Spirit. And so there was maybe more of a, uh, you know, each one in turn is going to maybe do his thing. Maybe there was a number of uh, uh, pastors there or these lay prophets, whatever they were. were, were it's, it's a little confusing what exactly was going on. But... 
He says, let all things be done for edification, for building up in the church. And so he starts to lay down some guidelines. Yeah, if someone's going to speak in a tongue, let it be two or three in turn and let someone interpret it. In other words, don't all, I mean, I've, I've been to a Pentecostal church where by the end of the thing, you know, the choir's going crazy, guys running around speaking in tongues, everyone's running around with their tambourines. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of madness. No one knows what's going on. You can't hear anything. And that's kind of, I don't know if that's exactly what was going on, but something like that was happening in Corinth where Paul had to set down some order and say, one at a time, please. Speak so we can understand you and do it for the building up of the church. Do it for, for edifying and for, for teaching the church. Uh, and in fact, um, at, well, at the end of the chapter, verse 40, all things should be done decently and in order. Um, and there's maybe a, a simple summary that can apply, be applied to, to other contexts. But all of that is, is kind of to say, in this realm, when it comes to, again, if you're going to use the word ceremonies, how are we going to come together and, and, and what is the manner in which we're going to be receiving the Lord's gifts other than sticking to what he has said? Well, in the realm where there's freedom, um, we're going to choose to do things uh, in order to build up the church. We're going to do things in order to clearly confess the gospel, in order to uh, um, do things in love for one another, and, and we're trying to make the best use of our freedom. We're not trying to make the most um, self-serving use of our freedom. That's always the struggle we have as sinners. As soon as we find a place where we have freedom, immediately the old man steps in and says, oh great, I, I, get, to, I get to call the shots now. <laughs> I get to do what I want. Uh, and that's never the case. The old man gets nowhere where he's allowed to call the shots. Uh, instead, the new man has to serve one another in love. Does that far make sense th thus far? Any, anything on that? Going once, going twice. Okay. Um, so then I, I want to give you a couple things here from, uh, uh, well, a few things we actually say in, in our confessions, uh, in the Lutheran confessions, uh, when it comes to such things and, and ceremonies and, and love. Um, now one point, maybe I hadn't said this yet, but first we've got to start off with the preliminary. Again, we want to make this, this distinction. Um, what, what was the, the chief worship of God again? Faith. faith. Yeah, the faith that receives God's gifts the way he gives them. Great, wonderful. That means any of the ceremonies over here, which by the way, there, there are ceremonies, just a few, over here, right? I mean, he took bread, he broke it, he blessed it, gave it. So when we're taking bread and blessing it and giving it to the disciples. That's a ceremony God actually instituted. But by and large, the ceremonies that the New Testament doesn't prescribe um, are not a part of divine worship in that, in that specific sense. Okay, if it's all our worship, both directions, okay, fine. But as far as what that worship is, uh, that, that is the faith that receives God's gifts, that's not what these ceremonies are for. Which is another way, this is part of what we confessed against Rome at the time of the Reformation. We're making the point that um, if, if the pastor is not wearing the exact vestments that the Pope says he ought to wear, that is neither pleasing nor displeasing to God. That's not the point. Uh, that's, that's neither for nor against the way God gives his gifts. There's freedom there. There's freedom there, and it's not something... It, this is the point Paul's making against those particular teachers uh, in, in Galatians and, and in some of the other epistles. Um, you don't have to submit to these particular laws in order to be a Christian, in order to receive God's gifts. Okay, so we make that point initially, and that's kind of the main point that, that Luther and the Reformers want to make in their day uh, for, for good reasons in the Reformation. But uh, we're also going to have a number of statements about, well, then what, what are the ceremonies for that we observe? We're going to have some sort of ceremony. What, what is it for? Here's a statement here. Um, well, how about this? Uh, they, that is the, the fathers, the, the ancient Christians, observed these human ceremonies because they were profitable for good order. Well, that sounds like Paul. Because they were profitable for good order, comma, because they gave the people a set time to assemble. Okay, that's very practical because they provided an example of how all things could be done decently and in order in the churches, and finally, because they helped instruct the people. For different seasons and various rites serve as reminders for the common folk. For these reasons, the fathers kept ceremonies, and for the same reasons, we also believe in keeping traditions. This is within a long article 
where we're, we're firing off with, with all Lutheran fierceness of, uh, no, Pope, we don't have to keep your traditions because you say so. No, we don't have to keep them in order to be righteous with God. But we keep them out of love. We keep them out of uh, an, a, an attempt to build up the church and to, um, to teach. And in fact, that's the, that's the main statement. In fact, do I have that here? Uh, yeah. In, in the, the Apology, we say this. However, ceremony should be celebrated to teach people the scriptures, that those admonished by the word may conceive faith and godly fear, and may also pray. This is the intent of ceremonies. Uh, and, and in anything that we do in the church, hopefully... The point is that it's to teach. Um, and maybe, maybe an example for this. Uh, well, okay. <clears throat> I used this with someone years ago uh, where, you know, the question was, well, in fact, it was kind of along this point. Well, we're free. We can just do it however we want. Why does it matter? Why don't we just do, do whatever we want? Uh, and, and the point was made. I forget where I had gotten this from. But, uh, okay, we're having the Lord's Supper. We're, we're observing the institution, we've, we've taken bread, we've blessed it, we're going to give it out. Uh, there's nothing in the scriptures that says we can't. Just take a big loaf, snap it over your leg, and start tossing it out into the, into the crowd. Here, you take some, you get some, you get some. But why wouldn't we do that? I've never seen anyone do this in, in any church, actually, by the way. <laughs> but why not? Why wouldn't you do that? It's free, right? You have freedom. Well, you have to have order. That's true. That's true. That's part of it. I suppose you can make a sort of order where that's just how we do it here. We (laughs) projectile the Lord's Supper to you. What's wrong about that? That should strike you as odd, as an odd thing if someone would do that. It's disrespectful. Right. And like you're not like truly taking into account what you have there. Yes. So 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 the issue is what does it say? Or what does it confess about what this is? In other words, this is my roundabout way of, of trying to illustrate what you do in certain things with, with certain ceremonies does teach. Um, we're used to thinking very didactically. Well, how do you teach someone? Well, you, you tell it. You explain it to them. Um, but actions speak louder than words in many cases. What you do does, does in fact teach and, and send a message. Uh, so the alternative, or there's a number of alternatives, I suppose, but in, however one is observing the supper, for instance, well, ideally, it would be done in a way that communicates reverence, or at least communicates that there is something going on here. You think of, um, we, we mentioned last time, um, in 1 Corinthians, Paul's dealing with that same Corinthian con- congregation. They had a number of issues, but one of them was the supper, and part of, his, uh, part of Paul's criticism of them is, look, you're treating this like it's any old meal. You know, you're, you're bringing your, your drinks from home, you're coming, you're sitting down at the table, the poor are not getting any, the rich are getting drunk and, and fat and full. And, uh, you know, one aspect there is you're not loving, you're not observing a ceremony in love for, the, for the, your neighbor, but also that you're not recognizing what this is. And that's why he brings them back to the words of institution. He says, look, here's what Jesus said, you know, on the night he was betrayed, he took, he goes through the whole thing with them. And therefore, he says, look, therefore, if you're uh, doing this in a way that's not right, you're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let me remind you what's actually going on here. Part of his point is you ought to be doing this in a way that actually uh, is, is aware of and respectful and, and communicates what this is. Because if you, to, to, to boil it down, if you believe one thing and then what you're actually doing communicates something different. Well, that's a problem, right? That's, that's not what we want. Uh, and, and the, well, this goes back to an example I, I started to uh, at the end of last time. Uh, the diamond, you know, the beautiful diamond is still a wonderful, beautiful diamond, even if it's set in, you know, gross, splintery, wooden ring or something. I don't know. Imagine something unfitting for a, for a wedding band or something. Um, it's still a diamond. It's still God's wonderful gift. Uh, however, there could be ceremonies or there could be, there could be um, you know, the way that, that it's conducted that does a better job of communicating, of expressing and confessing what we actually believe about, about these gifts. Does that make sense? 
<clears throat> but it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't, you say teach, doesn't it start with the confirmation when you give the, the children the confirmation from the catechism and everything? Oh, sure. Well, them the sacraments sure. and everything. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, and, and, and that teaching also is something I've, I've been thinking about a lot. Um, how, how can, uh, as a pastor I'll say, how can my teaching <clears throat> be not just purely didactic, purely I'm just telling you, but how can you also experience it? How is it being communicated in, in, in what we do? Um, I'll give you an example. I, I try, I've been with, with Eric going through uh, adult confirmation here or adult catechesis, and uh, I try and make sure that I'm always praying with him before we start. I try and, I try and pray here before we start. Well, that's a, nothing, nothing, nothing commands me that I must pray every time we start a Bible study or I start <clears throat> teaching someone. But first of all, I need it. <laughs> Second of all, uh, that's a way to actually confess what we really believe, that these things aren't, it's not from me. It's not from, you know, I can do all that. I can, I can study my entire life and it still is not enough. It has to be the Holy Spirit coming and teaching you through, through the scripture, through the word. Same thing with the service. We could, we could conduct the service in a way that totally, uh, totally omits, you know, acknowledgement of, of prayer and acknowledgement of we're calling upon God, but we don't do that. We start the service with calling upon God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We do everything we can to try and communicate in our, in our you know, conduct um, that this is not us, you know, it's not our work for God, that it's God's work for us. We're trying to communicate that in every way we can. We're trying to, we're trying to present Christ. Not only in word, but in but in but in act and in uh, in our behavior, um, and that's I, I suppose that's mainly the the summary um, as far as I wanted to talk about ceremonies. So uh, so we mentioned you know anything that is um, is, is in, incongruent, anything that doesn't match with what we actually believe about what it is. Well, well, and, and in fact, it's something we don't want to do. And and in fact, the point I want to make is when we read about adiaphora and this term. Uh, especially the way the, the Lutheran reformers used it in, in the 16th century, they place a lot of limits on it. It's not just, you know, do whatever you want. They make a point of, um, in fact, do I have it? The, the phrase they say of, uh, maybe I've got it. There's a phrase somewhere in there specifically saying that uh, anything that is, um, what do they say? The phrase is something like silly displays or, or useless uh, something or other. You know, anyway, something, something that's silly or, or pointless uh, is not adiaphora, <coughs> they say. That's something you just shouldn't do in this service, is, 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 is his point. Um, but more broadly, we could say, Things that, that don't match with what we actually believe about it. Things that give the impression that we believe things we don't. So this is where we have a problem where we don't want to import customs from, from other confessions. Uh, we don't want to copy whatever the Baptists down the street are doing. We don't want to copy just whatever the Roman Catholics are doing, if one's inclined that way. We don't just go copy other churches <laughs> because they have a different confession. We have to be wary of those things. Um, and, and, and anything that is, uh, well, as we said before, uh, irreverent, I suppose we could say, um, those, those things cease to be adiaphora. Now these become things that should not be done. Uh, whether or not God's given a particular command against it, we have the more general teaching of the apostles, right? That things should be done for edification of the church, for building up and, and for good order. Uh, and so for that reason, the church generally uh, prefers not to um, not to borrow ceremonies and customs from other churches or from just secular life uh, and the world around us. If we're going to do, do things some way, we want to try and look to what the church has historically done. Not that that becomes a law. We don't want to stick it over here and say that that's demanded. There are many things the church has done in history that uh, we don't want to do. We don't want to copy. That's very important. But we do generally want to... Um, and this is the attitude the, the, the confessions actually take uh, on the point where we say, you know, the, the ancient church established these things for good order, uh, and that's why we keep them when we can. In fact, where is that statement? Um, 
Well, in any case, the, the statements from uh, 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 the confessors on, you know, we, we don't abolish the, the divine service, and we don't abolish any of the, uh, well, we don't abolish in general the traditional ceremonies that go with it. We abolish those that are contrary to the gospel. And that's generally the attitude the, the Lutheran reformers took. We're going to keep what we can. We're going to keep those things that were established for good order and for good reason. We're going to get rid of those things that, that were not. All right. Um, the thing that I hope everybody understands about liturgy, especially Lutheran liturgy, and I've always loved it, and that is we speak to God the words he has given to us. So even in that adiaphora of, all right, which words of God are so we going to use here yeah. and there? Or, yeah, we can, we can bring in another text if we, want, if we have a, a season of, uh, of the year or a particular theme. We can bring that in here or there. It may be uh, to the, use it as a colic or, or something else. We can, uh, re we're simply reciting to God or responding to God with his words right, back yeah. to him. And that helps us not throw in silly things. Sure, yeah. But, it, but, but we can be focused on what we're, we're, we want to focus on in that particular yeah. service yeah. theme, sermon, whatever, by drawing those texts in rather than making something up. Right, exactly. This is, uh, this is a, a, a personal fear of I want to try and avoid making stuff up when I'm planning the services as much as possible. And I hope you know that, that what goes into the bulletins is, is essentially never, uh, oh, hey, I just thought of this is cool. Let me stick that in there. But I'm, I'm going back to, I'm looking at the sources, uh, or, or I'm looking first of all at our hymnals and what we have as a synod put together. I'm looking at what are the uh, historic prayers used for that day, and I'm, I'm trying to rely on uh, the church's wisdom and, and not my own in those things. But, but exactly, and we're going to see this in the weeks going forward, um, I mean, almost everything, like 99.9% .9 of, of the very words of, of the divine service are straight out of Scripture. Um, one of the great benefits, sometimes this is a concern for maybe those who aren't used to that kind of worship and are, are used to a more... Um, I want to say free form, just, you know, we've got a bunch of uh, our, our Baptist hymns or our songs, and the preacher just gets up and goes for, for a half hour. If that's the whole service, if that's what people are used to, one of the fears is that they're going to come into this more liturgical or this more formal um, uh, way of conducting the service, and, oh, but, but we're not getting as much Bible. Or, you know, and, oh, we're getting all these words, but we're not getting the words. Well, the whole point of it is you're hearing and repeating and echoing back and forth the words of Scripture all the time. Over and over and over. Some of them are every week. Some of them are different every time. And, and one of the most beautiful things that, that we have that we ought to hold on to and, and value highly is the way that as the, as the church year goes around and as the seasons change, these different sort of texts intermingle and, and kind of help interpret one another. Um, you know, so, okay, today I'm going to be preaching on the gospel, but you're also going to be hearing some other texts that are going to, even if I don't mention, I can't mention every single thing in the service, in, in the sermon, there's too much. Uh, but you're going to be hearing them, and if you're paying attention, hopefully those words are going to start to help interpret one another. Um, and, and especially the ones that are the same all the time are hopefully words of scripture that are shaping you and forming you over and over. They're becoming something that's, that's you know, internalized. Uh, and, and that's, I think, yeah, one of the beautiful things about, if I can just call it historic liturgy and historic ways of worshiping uh, rather than kind of much more modern ideas is you're just you're just echoing and being kind of soaked in uh, in scripture all the time um, that's that's one of the best parts about it um let's see we're, we're, we're coming close to time we'll maybe end, end here in a minute is there anything else any other questions or or comments on that point you know one more thing but any, anything else one of the points in, uh, this is uh, Dr. Winger, Thomas Winger, in his essay that I'm kind of trying to, to give you. Uh, one of the points he makes on, on this idea, what are we going to do with our freedom? What are we going to do with our adiaphora? He makes a point of, um, one of the things that should be very important to us is, con yes, confessing Christ, but confessing Christ as he became incarnate for us. 
So one of the one of the features of maybe our services that might be different uh, or might be lacking in, in churches of other traditions um, is a very physical kind of tangible nature to things. So you know, there's a lot of sitting and standing and and um, you know certainly things centering around the the sacrament of the altar. It's very physical, right? The reception of of the supper or or in any of the kind of the you know, odd little ceremonies that happen through the year. Um, there's a few times where, where I, as your pastor, get to actually put my hand on you. Or when the kids come up for a blessing, you know, put my hand on their head. Um, and there's other contexts, those sorts of things happen. Physicality is actually an important part um, of, of our customs, our, our ceremonies in the divine service, for exactly that reason, because Christ became man. Uh, and we also want to confess with our, our services that um, we're, not just, we're not just human beings that our souls are redeemed and we're just thinking in our minds about Christ and that's where faith all takes place. Well, that's part of it. But your body's been redeemed. Uh, your body is, is a part of what Christ has redeemed with his own body. And your body's going to be raised on the last day and you in your body are going to be worshiping uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for all eternity. And so there's a very bodily aspect to our, to our worship. And I thought that was a... A fantastic point to, uh, to make. Well, anything else for today? Sounds good. We're all good. All right, let's pray and uh, prepare for the service. Oh, Lord, have mercy upon us. Grant us your Holy Spirit through your word today as we indeed receive your gifts as you would give them. Uh, grant to us faith to receive them. Uh, and grant us also then to return thanks and to worship you in true faith and holiness. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, thank you all. I think uh, next time uh, we're going look to start looking at the structure of the service and then actually start to dig, dig in. Enough intro stuff, let's actually start getting into the, the text of the service. Thank you.